Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to this uh, USC T cores and uh, Institute for Addiction Science special event. My name is Adam Leventhal. I co direct the Tobacco Center of Regulatory Science at USC and also executive director for the Institute for Addiction Science. And uh, we are, are extremely uh, pleased for this special event to have Dr. Brian King, director of the Center of Tobacco Products of FDA. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about um, Dr. King. So, um, so he's been appointed the director of the FDA Center for Tobacco Products uh, in July 2022, and he's been very, very busy, lots of activity. And uh, in this position, if you don't know, um, Dr. King's responsible for assuring that the center accomplishes its public health goals for operationalizing the center's vision and mission and that it implements the Family, uh, the family Smoking Permission Tobacco Control Act. Uh, Dr. King has worked for nearly two decades to provide sound scientific evidence to inform tobacco control policy and to effectively communicate this information to key stakeholders, including decision makers, the media, and the public. Prior to FDA, he served as the Deputy Director of Research Translation in CDC's Office of Smoking and Health, and more recently as uh, executive editor of CDC's Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report series. He's authored more than 200 scientific papers uh, related to tobacco prevention and control. He served as senior scientific editor for multiple US Surgeon General's reports on tobacco. Um, and was lead author on CDC's evidence-based guide, best practices for comprehensive tobacco control programs. And Dr. King is a scientist and holds a PhD in MPH in epidemiology from State University of New York at Buffalo. And um, so we're just really excited to have him and I'll let you take it away. Brian, thank you so much for coming. Welcome. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate that introduction. I will add that it's all true, and I did it before my first colonoscopy, so you can <laughs> add that to the, to the next intro. Um, so lovely to see you all. We've had a lot of great meetings already um, with folks this morning, and I know there's several in the afternoon. Um, it's always um, a, a thrill um, to, to meet with folks who are doing um, great scientists. As a scientist myself, um, I appreciate all the important work that you all are doing, and, and um, uh, seeing what's to come as well is even more exciting for me. Um, so I'm not a big fan of death by PowerPoint. So I'm going to aim to talk for about 35, you know, 30, 35 minutes. So we're going to have at least half the time for Q&A. So please save those questions. I know we got a lot of folks um, online um, as well. Um, so appreciate, I'm sure there's a mechanism there um, to funnel those questions, but I uh, look forward to some um, constructive um, uh, dialogue with folks. Um, so without further ado, I'll get rolling um, in terms of, um, or maybe I won't get rolling. I just yeah. There we go. Okay, right. so this won't work. Okay, so I'll go off this. Okay, um, so in terms of the agenda, I'm just going to start with some tobacco use patterns, just so we're all on the same page. I may be preaching to, to this choir, um, but I think it's important for um, the context around where we're headed um, as a, a broader um, a center at FDA. Um, and then just give an overview of, of regulation of tobacco products in the United States um, in terms of what the context is that we are working with. And then give some programmatic updates, some hot topics, things that are happening out in the ether um, uh, in um, this space. And then also looking forward um, uh, where we are, are headed as a, a broader regulatory community. So I'll start with this bell curve. Sorry for the folks in the cheap seats. This was not intended to be an eye exam. I will walk you through it, rest assured. It looks like you've got a screen. Um, uh, but this, I think, is, is testament to what a profound impact we've made um, in terms of reducing combustible cigarette smoking in this country over the past um, a, a half century plus. I think it's one of the greatest public health achievements of the past century in terms of how we've accomplished that. And if you look at, you know, what was the driving forces, it was, you know, one awareness around the health risks of tobacco use, um, but also the information um, around population-based interventions and really implementing those at the local, state, and national level. 
Um, FDA regulation is but a blip on this bell curve for the scientific classicists. Um, I hope we have a perfect bell curve and we keep this going down, um, but we've still got more work to do. And I remind folks, we've got over 30 million um, adults in this country who are still um, using combustible products, um, which um, we know um, are a toxic um, a cocktail of 7,000 chemicals and 70 carcinogens. And we also continue to see diversification of the tobacco product landscape. Um, an important reminder that our work is not done um, to make sure that we are doing everything we can to best protect the public from tobacco-related disease and death. Um, that said, a key lever to accomplish that is prevention, right? Benjamin Franklin said it many years ago, and it still holds true, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, and I couldn't agree more. That's why I'm in the field of public health. I initially planned to go into medicine and then realized that it's a hell of a lot um, easier um, if you prevent it from starting in the first place um, than treating on the back end. Of course, you still need both, but you get a, a harder bang um, at the onset by preventing people People from using products in the first place. And that is no more true when it comes to tobacco products. We know that the vast majority of adult smokers um, are initiating before the age of, of 18 um, and um, nearly all um, before the age of, of 25. And so if you can hit that critical window of prevention, you're preventing people from using um, uh, these products for the rest of, of their lifetime. And so it's definitely a, a critical juncture and similar patterns of use for other tobacco products as, as well. Um, in terms of, you know, where we're at, you know, when it comes to prevention, and I'm focusing most of my remarks today on the, on the youth, you know, young adult piece, um, it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, so if you look in the red, um, that's e-cigarette use, which surpassed use of all other tobacco products um, uh, back um, in 2014. So we're now 10 years with e-cigarettes being the most commonly used product. And it's a very important reminder to us around the incredibly dynamic nature of the tobacco product landscape, particularly when it comes to emerging products like e-cigarettes. Um, the good news is that we're seeing declines um, in, in use, which is a good thing. Um, we had over 5 million kids using e-cigarettes according to NYTS at the peak in 2019, and we're now less than half that, um, which is a good thing. Um, public health win, but we still got a ways to go. Um, and we also um, have to be mindful that there is continued use of other products um, as, as well. Um, that said, e-cigarettes remain the most commonly used, and there's um, continued um, uh, common patterns of use, including um, flavors. Nine out of 10 kids um, who are using e-cigarettes using flavored varieties, and there's also um, uh, clearly certain brands that are more popular than others, and that continues to evolve over time. Um, the latest 2023 data, Elf Bar, um, was most common, followed by Escobar, um, both um, Chinese manufacturers, and then uh, disposable products. But I also remind folks that cartridge-based systems are still being used by kids as well. And so what we don't want to do is laser focus on a single product class, um, which um, is not um, uh, going to be wise in the long term. And if we want to be nimble to address all products that kids are using. Um, and so the third and fourth are cartridge-based systems as well. And so FDA maintains a nimble enforcement strategy that I'll talk about in a bit about how we navigate um, that, that environment. That said, we've got our work cut out for us. This is just an example, which I'm sure you all have, have seen before, of just how dynamic that landscape is. Um, and in tobacco regulation, we do not um, you know, deal in, in years. We do deal in uh, weeks and sometimes months um, in terms of the evolution of the landscape, particularly when it comes to e-cigarette products. And so an increasing challenge is making sure we have the data we need to inform actions um, across the regulatory paradigm, including enforcement, um, but also communications um, and, and rulemaking. And so being able to have that rapid and nimble data to help inform our strategy um, is, is very critical to us. And so speaking of which, you know, what um, is our paradigm for regulation in the United States? So as I said, we're relatively new. So 2009 is when FDA got authority to regulate um, tobacco products. Um, uh, I frequently say that we're kind of in our adolescence. I get some flack for it. I, I don't really care. Um, I think it's true. Um, you have other centers that have been around for over 100 years. Um, and so they have had the luxury of foundational rulemaking where they have implemented these foundational rules and now they have the ability to do um, a lot of more forward thinking rulemaking and other strategies once they have that solid foundation. We're still in the process of building that foundation at CTP, um, including you know, our first product standards, getting a tobacco product manufacturing rule and other rulemaking I'm, I'm gonna talk about. Um, but um, the reality is, is that we're still in the process of getting to that place. And I'm hopeful that we're making inroads each day to accomplish that. 
Um, for folks who aren't aware, in 2016, that was the deeming rule, and that's when we um, uh, brought all these emerging products under our authority. So that included e-cigarettes. And so the time period that we've been regulating e-cigarettes is even shorter um, than for these other conventional products. And then, of course, as we always see with industry, they can tend to evolve and try um, you know, to see opportunities, at least some in the industry, to circumvent um, regulation. And so our initial authorities were tobacco products um, that were containing nicotine um, derived from the tobacco plant. And so we immediately saw entities shift um, to um, uh, non-tobacco nicotine, including synthetic nicotine. And so in April of 2022, Congress um, clarified our authority to regulate products from any source, um, including synthetic. But importantly, we carefully ensured that that um, uh, uh, technical assistance that was provided to Congress informed non-tobacco nicotine to cover any other potential iteration of how nicotine could be created in the future. We know that there are other options beyond tobacco derived as well as um, synthetic in lab, and we wanted to make sure that we encapsulated that um, uh, moving forward. Um, but the good news is we've got that clear authority and we continue to take a variety of programmatic actions. And I wanna walk you through the big four. Um, and so these are the big um, bucket areas of work we do, compliance and enforcement, pre-market review of applications, rules and regulations, and, and public education. I'm going to start with enforcement because that's the one that gets the most attention um, uh, these days on a variety of, of fronts. Um, we follow a three-fold strategy um, for enforcement compliance um, at, at FDA around tobacco. First is we want to assume admirable intents. So we want to give all regulated industry the resources and information they need to comply with the law. Um, but concurrent to that, we also do regular inspections. We've got arrangements with all 50 states, um, as well as territories and tribes, and we are regularly um, doing inspections and investigations. Um, you can see all the status of all of those on the um, uh, internet. We have a, a searchable database where you can see that, um, and those will continue um, to occur and even increase um, in the future. Um, in those inspections, if we find violative actions, we can then escalate from there and take enforcement action when entities are breaking the law. So who do we have authority over? These are the big four. So manufacturers, importers, um, distributors, and, and retailers. Um, these are across the, the supply chain, and we follow a comprehensive approach um, to make sure that we are maximizing the resources that we have. Um, we do think it's important to make sure we take actions across all four of those. Um, of course, it's easier higher up in the supply chain um, when you're dealing with single manufacturers and importers, um, but we also want to make sure that we do have a presence across the entire supply chain, and indeed we have um, since the inception of the center. Um, these are our metrics in terms of online investigations. We've done over 1,300. Um, we've also issued a series of actions around manufacturers and, and also retailers. These are a few examples. Um, the retailers are a combination of um, underage sales, um, but also sales of unauthorized products. Um, within the past two years, we've ramped up our enforcement activity. So we typically start with a warning letter. Um, there's a misperception that the warning letters don't um, work. Um, we actually see the majority of people who get the warning letters do comply, but we can't always tell you what they did because sometimes there's confidential uh, company information. And so just because you're not seeing a response doesn't mean that it's not happening. Um, a good example of when a warning letter works is actually very relevant to this crowd. Um, and so um, the uh, last year or the year before, it was in 2022, um, uh, you all had published some useful information around nicotine gummies. Um, and there was a lot of attention around it. We also got intelligence from other sources, including from clinical spheres around concerns over these products. And we issued a warning letter to an online um, manufacturer within hours of issuing um, that warning letter, they were shut down. And frequently we do see that when we do issue warning letters, but it's not all the time. And in that case, we can escalate. And more recently, we have escalated. So we've issued the first civil money penalties against e-cigarette manufacturers. Um, we've issued the first injunctions against e-cigarette manufacturers in coordination with the US Department of Justice. We've also issued the first civil money penalties against retailers for the maximum amount of $20,000. And we're working on a new guidance to ramp it up even further. Statutorily, we can go up to a million. Um, and so the goal is to get those fines as high as possible so that people are no longer selling violative action, uh, uh, products. And so we've had a lot of activity, as I've noted. Um, typically, we start with the warning letter, and then we can escalate from there. And so we've had a series of blitzes among retailers beginning with last summer, and we do this on a monthly basis now. And so we're out there um, in the ether across many states, making sure that we are continuing to do the reinvestigations and issue the civil money penalties. And they are working. We are seeing the impact. Again, we can't always say what's happening on the back end, but I will tell you um, that the majority of entities that receive these comply, and if they don't, we're going to come back in, we're going to find them even more next time. And that's the goal of our enforcement strategy and continued efforts. In terms of where we're prioritizing our efforts, um, <clears throat> it's primarily youth appealing products. 
Um, and so, um, you know, for e-cigarettes right now, it's disposable flavored varieties. But as I noted before, we're not putting all our eggs in one basket. We want to be nimble and be mindful that um, it can change very quickly. These are some egregious examples where we issued warning letters um, against manufacturers. Um, at FDA, we do acknowledge there is a continuum of risk of products. Then if an adult smoker were to use an e-cigarette to transition fully from a cigarette, it would be a net benefit to the individual. We know there are some people that are transitioning completely. That said, it's a very hard sell for me that you need SpongeBob SquarePants emblazoned across the products in order to successfully do so. These are egregious examples. Um, and uh, we're doing um, what we can to make sure these are off the market in addition to the other products that are heavily used by kids, um, uh, namely um, disposable flavored varieties that are not authorized. But it's not just e-cigarettes. Um, we also take action across um, the tobacco product landscape. We recently took actions against Zin, um, and this included um, our routine um, inspections we've done for retailers um, in terms of um, underage sales for these products across the country. Um, and then we also did issue um, uh, warning letters as well to online retailers for unauthorized products. Um, and so these are just a few examples of what's coming. Um, and it, uh, there's definitely will be more if you get a warning letter, there's likelihood of reinspection. Um, and so we're committed to using the full scope of our authority across all products um, that kids are using or that um, could potentially be very appealing to kids in the future. And we want to be um, making sure that we're proactive in staving off any repeats of the situation that we saw in this country, um, particularly the 2017 um, spike in e-cigarette use among kids. Um, but as I noted, we also um, can take other actions in more severe, and we've started to do that, including the civil money penalties and the injunctions. One thing that I think people don't know is FDA does have independent litigation authority. And so what that means is that, you know, I can't willy-nilly do whatever I please and expect the lawyers at FDA to be able to defend me in court. We need to work with DOJ. Um, to do that. And so what that means is that we also have to coordinate with them in terms of where we pick our battles. And so with limited resources, you have to maximize the, uh, the opportunity and to get the greatest public health impact. And so that's why we're really focusing on these high youth appealing products with our resources, including these civil money penalties, the injunctions and the actions that we are taking. Um, and that involves a lot of players. And so we work very closely with the U.S. Department of Justice, again, um, uh, who does have litigation authority and represents us in these matters, and also Customs and Border Protection. Um, and I think this is, is one area where we've also ramped up efforts in the past two years. Um, you may have heard we did a joint operation with Customs and Border at LAX. Um, airport where we seized $18 million in unauthorized e-cigarettes um, at the port of entry. And we also recently um, uh, did a seizure of an e-cigarette distributor um, in, in California um, for repeated violation of unauthorized sales. And these are the first of many to come. Um, and I look forward to continued collaborations with other departments, but I can't reinforce enough the importance of an all government approach. And frequently FDA is always dragged as the entity when in many cases, um, we're not the only cook in the kitchen responsible for getting to the goal that we want to, um, but there's also other entities with authorities and it includes DOJ, it includes Customs and Border, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, US Postal Service, Federal Trade Commission, US Marshals. There's a whole alphabet soup of folks that serve a role and it's really critical that we delve all of those entities to make sure we have as uh, strong an impact as possible. Um, so in terms of compliance and enforcement, uh, of course, uh, we are responsible for enforcing the law, um, and that's primarily products that are on the market illegally. But Congress has given um, a, a clear standard through the Tobacco Control Act about how we are to regulate these products and authorize them. Um, FDA does not approve tobacco products because we know every tobacco product has risk. Um, so we're not going to approve a product like a therapeutic treatment. And so we have an appropriate for pub protection of public health standard. And so Congress has um, required that we weigh the benefits versus the risks in the applications that, that do come in. And so any tobacco product that entered the market after a certain date in 2007 has to submit an application to us. And that's considered a new tobacco product. And they have to demonstrate the benefits outweigh the risks. And so the risks are typically youth initiation, depending on the, the product. Um, and then the benefits, in, for example, in the case of e-cigarettes, is going to be the potential for those products to help adult smokers transition um, uh, completely. Um, in terms of volume, simply unprecedented, 26 million. Um, applications um, we receive. Just to give you a little flavor, um, most FDA centers get a couple dozen applications a year. Um, and we have about one fifth the number of staff um, and, and several millions times the volume of applications to go through. So we've got our work cut out for us, but we've taken action on 99% of applications. Um, we have authorized 23 e-cigarettes to date. Um, I'll say there will be more authorizations. 
Um, but at present, these are the ones that met the public health standard. It is doable, but you got to bring the science to demonstrate that you've met that standard. Millions have not received um, uh, that authorization, but there's ample opportunities as part of the application process, including um, through the issuance of deficiency letters, but working with companies to provide that information. And there's ultimately opportunity, even if there's a marketing denial order, to resubmit um, with information to ensure that companies are giving us the science that we need to make fully informed decisions. Um, that said, um, we're getting a uh, continued influx of applications. A lot of people are like, when are you going to be done with the applications? We'll never be done with the applications because there's always going to be innovation. Um, and so people are going to continue to be submitting new applications. But our goal is to get within the 180 day statutory deadline that Congress required. And I'm hopeful we're going to get there, um, but we've got to get through the bolus of 26 million applications first. And that also includes another million applications through synthetic, synthetic um, products, which um, I inherited a few days upon my arrival in this position. And I remember doing the math, the calculation um, at the time, and Congress wanted us to get it done in 60 days. And after doing the math, it was clear that in order to accomplish that, we would have had to do 17,000 applications a day. Um, and that's working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so Herculean at best, impossible at worst. But what my job is to make sure that we follow the science and get it done. And we have gone through 100% of those in terms of acceptance review. And the vast majority have not made it through to the next round because they didn't have the sufficient information to get to that round. There's close to 10,000 that have. So it is possible. Um, and those go on to more substantive review where we lift open the hood further and examine um, the merits of the individual applications. So here are some recent decisions. Um, in terms of e-cigarette um, authorizations in the United States, they've all been denials um, uh, within um, uh, the, the past um, uh, couple years. Um, that's not to say that there won't be authorizations in the future, um, but at present, we're still working through that massive bolus of applications. Um, and so these are the latest denial orders. And once a denial order is issued, um, uh, it, that uh, product then, of course, um, is, is uh, subject um, to um, enforcement action. Um, before they get a denial, they're also subject to it as well if they choose to, to sell the product. There's no safe harbor simply by submitting an application um, that protects you from enforcement action, but we particularly prioritize those products that do have marketing denial orders. We're also continuing to work through applications. There was a lawsuit on um, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, sued FDA um, to um, uh, review more expeditiously the applications. Um, uh, those we are almost nearly done with. Um, so we're at 94% and we anticipate we'll finish the rest of those by quarter two of this year. Um, again, we wanna get these done just as much as everyone else, but we have to do it in a scientific and legally defensible manner. And that's, that's my commitment. Um, and we're gonna take the time we need to get it right. Um, so in terms of other things happening, rules and regulations are certainly a topic um, uh, du jour. Um, in terms of the rulemaking process, for those who can remember back in the 80s, the school how, how uh, rock, remember the how a bill becomes a law. Um, we need to get a funny infographic um, for how um, you know, a rule becomes proposed to final. Um, but it's a very um, uh, arduous bureaucratic process, um, one that, that is important because you want to make sure you give the appropriate input from folks. Um, but I'll say that federal rulemaking is not for, for the weary, and you've got to be in it for the long haul. And so basically, you propose a rule. Well, before you propose it, you announce that you intend to propose it. And then you actually propose it. Then you open it up for public comment. And then based on those comments, you decide what you're going to do next, which could be to finalize it or you know, to, to pull it. And so there's a variety of, of rulemakings that FDA is, is working on, including um, product standards that have gotten a lot of attention. Um, so there's two final rules that have gone all the way through the process, and they're the very tail end, um, one to ban menthol and cigarettes and one to ban all um, characterizing flavors and cigars, um, excluding tobacco. Um, and those are in the very final stages. I get a lot of questions on these. My response is um, it's not a matter of, of if, but when at this juncture. We've gotten these rules um, as um, far along in the process as they've ever been. I can assure you it's a priority for me um, and uh, the FDA and the commissioner to make sure that we do finalize these and we're gonna do everything we can to continue keeping it moving. Um, we've been working tirelessly over the past two years and many years before that to get to these juncture and I remain hopeful. Um, and so they'll continue to be a priority until they are finalized. Um, we're also working on a proposed um, rule to cap um, nicotine and uh, cigarettes and certain other combustible products. This has been an end game strategy in the tobacco control community for decades. Um, would be monumental um, to protect public health. And if folks want to talk about um, a harm reduction strategy, talk about this, um, a, a very effective if we want to reduce risk among the population. Um, and so we intend to propose that um, after the menthol and flavored um, policies are finalized. 
But this isn't the only type of rules we do. Um, we also um, do um, uh, tobacco product manufacturing standards is another good example of another one. You know, Tobacco 21 um, is, a, is another example, working on finalizing that rule. Um, and these imp are important, again, as that foundational strategy to give us that structure that we can then build upon. Once you have these, um, uh, these ground level um, requirements in place, you can then build from there um, in terms of requirements um, for, for manufacturers and, and others. So the last area I wanna to touch on is public education. And this is really important. I know we've got some folks that are working in, in comms and other areas, including social media um, with this um, shop. And this is an important component of FDA's portfolio. Um, in my CDC days, I was very adamant um, around you know, best practices for comprehensive tobacco um, control programs. And one hallmark of those is mass reach health communication campaigns. We know they work, um, particularly um, around the prevention paradigm. And so for FDA's role, we um, put um, heavy resources in prevention campaigns. Um, and these are our latest from the Real Cost campaign um, that started as cigarettes 10 years ago. We're actually celebrating our 10-year anniversary this year. So we'll have a, a webinar actually um, in June uh, next month. Um, but um, we've also expanded to include e-cigarettes and we've transitioned to solely digital uh, format for these since that's where kids are. And we do everything we can to target the message to the key audience, which in this case is kids, while mitigating the risk for the unintended audience, which in this case is adults. But I joke, I can't control adults who choose to watch kid um, uh, intended uh, content on YouTube and elsewhere. There's only so much I can do, folks. Um, so we're, we're doing what we can with what we've got. Um, another key area is also... Um, our work in the health equity sphere. And so um, we did do an ECR campaign as well um, around um, Next uh, Legends. It was called Focus Towards American Indian Alaska Native Youth. Um, and so we've got new creative for this as well. Um, and as um, folks in this room, I'm sure are well aware, there are marked disparities in use of tobacco products and that still holds for e-cigarettes as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this when I talk about our strategic plan in terms of how we prioritize health equity um, at the center. So in terms of other areas, I did want to give a, a shout out as well to um, our um, ongoing work um, on the Vaping Prevention Education Resource Center. And um, we've got a lot of great resources targeted towards youth influencers on this front to make sure teachers and parents and students have the resources they need, again, with that important critical prevention lens. Um, and I think um, we've got a lot of opportunity here to get the resources in the hands of kids to make sure that they make um, the, the right decision um, by not starting to use any um, uh, tobacco product. But on balance, we also acknowledge that cessation is key as well. And so we do have print materials um, uh, related to cessation. These were some young adult focused ones also um, with a health equity lens as well um, to ensure we're reaching key populations, including variations by race, ethnicity, um, LGBTQIA plus community um, and others um, to make sure that we're engaging those populations that have those disproportionately higher rates of use and making sure we're getting them that evidence-based information um, around the importance of, of cessation, um, particularly in the context of, of combustible products. And then we also have a variety of other resources. We work with CDC, we work with National Cancer Institute and others. And if you get anything out of this talk, it's comprehensive is key. And so in the federal government, it's very easy to you know, relate flat to any single agency and that's fine. You know, I accept that people have jobs um, and, and we can always do them better. Um, but it's also important to note all the people that have roles in this space. And so when it comes to our critical regulatory work, we also have to make sure we maximize opportunities for cessation as well. And so NCI and CDC are doing awesome work in the space and we coordinate with them around smokefree.gov and elsewhere and, and frequently route our materials um, to that key action of, you know, this is, is what you should do and this is where you can go for more help. And so um, we frequently send um, and our resources folks to those um, critical resources. So in terms of looking forward, I get a lot of questions. I've been in this role two years. Sometimes it seems like it's 20 years, um, uh, but, um, you know, where are you headed? Um, and, and where do you want to go ultimately with, with the center? Um, and however short or long I am in this position, um, I do very much consider my tenure as a transformative one. And I do think that there's a lot of opportunity to build on where we, we have been, but also move forward in a very um, important um, collegial and collaborative and data-driven way. Um, that said, within a couple of weeks of me taking the position, I got the gift of an external evaluation mandated by the commissioner of the FDA, um, which nothing says, you know, welcome to the job like that. Um, and I, I did welcome it publicly. And I, I personally, I, I agree. I think it's a great opportunity when you come in a new job to have someone external come in and lift open the hood for you and say, listen, this is what you're doing really good. 
This is what you, where you can approve and give you a clear action plan and blueprint, like sign me up. Um, it was incredibly helpful. Um, and so we had that external evaluation. They had 15 recommendations and we agreed to address all of them. Um, and they had important um, input um, uh, from the public that helped inform where we landed. And one of those recommendations was a strategic plan. Um, I kind of get a, a chuckle because at the time there was a lot of media and press saying that like the FDA CTP never had a strategic plan, and, which is not true. We've had many strategic plans um, and the intent was to revise the one that we had, but you know, you're not going to do that before a new center director comes in. And so there was still very much plans to do this and this uh, offered an opportune plan to take a collective approach. And um, I'm very adamant around uh, um, uh, against a top-down approach. Um, and so it's very important to me that we galvanize our staff. And so we involved all of our offices and each of them have ownership over each of the, the five goal areas that we arrived at, including um, the top one is focused on rules and regulation. Um, the second um, is around application review and finding efficiencies um, in the process to make sure we can be quicker, but also more efficient, which is more beneficial for everyone, including those submitting applications to those reviewing. Um, enhancing our compliance and regulation, uh, our regulatory um, efforts in terms of, of enforcement and compliance. Um, we continue to make inroads on that, um, but um, look forward to more to come on that space. That's very critical to me. Um, enhancing knowledge and understanding of risks associated with tobacco product use. This one is very important. It's multifold. It's prevention um, in terms of, of particularly youth initiation and cessation as well. Um, but FDA also does acknowledge the continuum of risk and educating adult smokers about the risks of tobacco products to make informed decisions. Of course, we want people to go to the FDA approved therapeutics first, but we also acknowledge that there are some adults that are using e-cigarettes. It's important that we give them the information that, hey, if you're going to use this product, you've got to transition completely and prolonged periods of dual use are not going to give you any benefit. And the end goal should be to quit completely. And so giving that information to key folks in a very data-driven and, and um, systematic way is something that we're working to um, better understand and to get the right information. And so we recently had an announcement of funding in coordination with NIH to, you know, get the information around what's the best message to relate to adult smokers. And, you know, two, how do we deliver it? And three, how do we minimize impact on the unintended populations, including youth? And so what we don't want to do is come out with some mass campaign or any other activity without knowing what the implications are. And so we're working to create the necessary studies, build the science, understand the implications of any messaging, and then go from there in terms of what that science shows, which is what we've always done with our prevention campaigns for years. So across all of these strategies, we have some cross-cutting themes. Um, and these were actually the four pillars um, when I came into office. I kind of championed four things. And then somehow they ended up um, in the actual strategic plan as well. And it, it, I think the public thrived off of just having a structure. Um, and it helped. And then we ultimately landed at these as the cross-cutting themes after all the feedback from everyone in the process. And so I'm pleased as punch. Um, but it certainly wasn't something I mandated. It was very much an organic approach. But one, um, strong, robust science. Um, I'm the first scientist in this role. We had a, a medical doctor, a lawyer, and now I'm the scientist. I'm sure there's a funny joke about us walking into a bar <laughs> together. Um, uh, but I adore both of them, um, Buffer and, and Mitch, um, and, and get along with them very well. And they build a strong foundation that I'm proud to have taken um, over the helm of. Um, but I think on the science front, it's critically important that we maintain the integrity of our scientific approach. And towards that end, um, I'm committed to accomplishing that. We have a new Office of Science Director who's been on the spot about a year now, so not quite new um, anymore, but Matthew Farley. Um, and we've got a dedicated team of over 550 scientists at the center that continue to work day in, day out to review applications and maintain that important scientific rigor. Um, I know there's a lot of talk out in the ether around things that happen, you know, frequently um, uh, suggestions that I've somehow overridden decisions. I can tell you that um, there has never been an override of, of uh, a tobacco product application by any center director, including myself, but we certainly have scientific discussions and that's important. That's part of the process. That's how science works, where you look at the science you have before, you collectively engage with colleagues and qualified scientists and you have a discussion around the merits of that science. And that's exactly what we do. And that happens at multiple levels, but ultimately the office of science makes the decision and the comprehensive review by a cadre of scientists. Any given application is touched by dozens of scientists with qualifications from epidemiology to social science um, to toxicology um, to, to medicine. Um, it's a vast array of disciplines to inform where we land. Um, the second area is health equity. I've been very vocal that I think we've been wholly deficient on this issue for many years in the broader field of public health. And the time is now to take action. We cannot be dancing in the streets around overall declines in combustible cigarette smoking without acknowledging that we are the 
people behind. We're also potentially leaving people behind with policies. And so we need to make sure that it's not just monitoring patterns of use, but we, when we implement policies, we need to do so in an equitable way so that we are ensuring that people are one, aware of the implications of the policy, but also we're getting resources to maximize the implications of those policies, such as cessation resources when you're implementing um, you know, broad population-based policies. So, so towards that end, um, I've made this a commitment for the center. Um, we've hired the first ever um, uh, um, senior advisor for health equity at CTP. It's the first center level health equity advisor in all of FDA. I hope more people follow suit. I think if you have a person 100% dedicated and a strong leadership um, a, a team member where we have positioned her to report directly to me, um, Dr. Charlene uh, Lafogue, that we'll, we'll have continued inroads in this space. Um, we've also hired someone on DEIA. Um, uh, to make sure that our workforce is also reflective of a broader society with key health equity principles. And so I think between these two new positions, we're well equipped to not only incorporate health equity in our programmatic portfolio, but also our workforce. Um, the second area is stakeholder engagement, um, the third area actually, I mean, this is really important to me. Um, I've got my bread and butter over um, a stakeholder engagement of my 20 year career in this field. And I think it's really important that we engage with people. And when we engage with people in a way that they understand, that empowers them, um, and that encourages future collaboration and coordination. And I think the field in general has become increasingly divisive um, and um, over um, the past several years. And I think we've got opportunity to, instead of focusing on where we don't agree, focus on where we do agree and find pathways to move forward in that regard. And there's frequently times I have conversations with people where I do not I agree um, with the underlying ideology um, or um, the reasoning for um, the stance that they take. But that doesn't mean we can't have a collegial and collaborative conversation about potential opportunities of how we can get to a space um, uh, where we are, are, are um, uh, you know, getting advancement of whatever a certain issue is. That said, there's some things where that may not be able to happen, but it, we'd be remiss if we didn't engage um, uh, in the meantime. And then finally, transparency is the last one. Um, this is something that I heard loud and clear with that external evaluation. Transparency, the T word was littered um, throughout it. So duly noted. Um, and I will say that we're working 24-7 um, uh, um, to make sure we are more transparent. Now, don't get me wrong. We're not going to go from Fort Knox to a national park overnight, um, but we're making inroads. And I do hope folks have acknowledged we have ramped up our public presence. Um, I'm traveling somewhere every single week. Um, for the past two years, I have given um, probably two to three talks a week um, and, and traveling somewhere across the country or world to engage with folks in person um, and to make sure that we are reaching a diverse set of stakeholders. We also are aiming for at least one release a week. And so you've probably seen enhanced messaging from the agency. We're also revamping our web content as well. Um, when I first came on, it was very clear to me um, there was even websites that I did not understand. Um, and if you've got an alphabet soup after your name and you still can't understand um, a, a web page, then maybe we need to think more strategically about plain language communication to the general public. And so I think we've got great opportunity there and we're making inroads. And I'll say, you know, more to come on this front. So wrapping it up, um, you know, how can you help? What can you do? Um, so expand the education efforts. We've got a lot of great resources. You can amplify that on social media um, and the important work you do in engaging with the public and community. You can collect data to inform our efforts. Um, there's a lot of great um, opportunities um, uh, for folks to uh, evaluate things that are happening at the local and state level that will help inform what can happen at the federal level. And that's been the hallmark of tobacco control for decades, if you think about it. You know, taxation in the 90s, smoke-free in the 2000s, age of sale in the 2010s, flavored policies in the 2020s. That's all galvanized from the local state you know, to the, the federal level. And so it's something can be said for the importance of that work. And so the great work you're doing in California and elsewhere definitely helps inform um, actions in other states, but also um, at the federal level. You can also participate in rulemaking. Um, so anytime we do a rule, we open up for public comment, even if we do a guidance. And so I encourage folks to do that. You don't have to be a big organization. You can be an individual and submit comments as well. And we value that. And we read every single one. In menthol and flavored cigar, we got 250,000 of them. So I got a lot of flack for why aren't you moving faster? Um, we were working very expeditiously um, and many um, vacations and holidays and evenings were missed, but 250,000 comments is a lot and you have to respond to every single one of them. And it's not me, Tarzan, you, Jane response. It's a very scientifically dense and coordinated response. And so we work very diligently to do that, but we can't review what we don't have. 
And so I encourage folks to participate. And then finally, reporting violations and adverse events. Um, tobacco product violations around enforcement can be submitted to CTP compliance. Um, and then if there's health and quality problems and adverse events on tobacco products, we can also investigate those as well. So a good example was the Abali outbreak several years back. Um, those are key conduits where we get information from the state and local level, and then it galvanizes up so that we can take action from there. So with that, um, closing um, thoughts, if you fell asleep, you can wake up um, and get the, the key take home message. Um, so we remain committed to using our authorities to reduce tobacco related disease and death. Um, and we do that through a variety of programmatic efforts. Those four big buckets are the main ones. And I will say that the research community serves a critical role in informing all of those efforts. We are a data-driven public health regulatory agency. And so we need data as part of that algorithm to make sure we inform the work that we're doing. And that comes from a variety of sources. It comes from applicants and their applications, but it also comes from broader society and the science that's out there in the ether to inform everything um, uh, from you know, our, our rules, um, but also to enforcement and compliance efforts. Um, and so I encourage more of that um, and continue to put that in your thinking cap when you're doing your study. You don't want a scientific shelf piece. Before you even start the study, think of one, why am I doing the study? What is the end goal? What do I want to accomplish? And make sure that you do the analysis, of course. You know, you're not going to modify the data, but craft the data and the presentation and tell the story in a way that can actually be used to affect change. And so simply putting a study together as a vanity project is not going to be effective to move the needle for action. And so I strongly encourage folks to think through that paradigm of, you know, what would be the story be on the New York Times with this study? What do I want to tell the public about what they can do with this actual data? And that's the type of stuff that's really going to help move the needle for on important work we do around tobacco regulation. So with that, I will close my bureaucratic mouthpiece and um, end with all of this um, uh, contact information. Um, contrary to far people, please, I am not on the other end of these social media streams. You'd be surprised the messages we get from people. And I also lament that for folks who knew me at CDC, I had a famous email address. My middle initial is A, so it was B-A King, so baking at cdc.gov. And so I used to get recipes. I used to get questions about salmonella and cookie dough, you name it. So I don't know where people are sending that now, but um, I am not um, showcasing my broad FDA address. But um, we've got a cadre of excellent stellar folks, over 1,100 staff at CTP that are working tirelessly um, uh, to help protect this country from tobacco-related disease and death. Um, and um, they're um, doing a variety of jobs. And we welcome the opportunity to engage with folks, including researchers, health comms professionals, enforcement compliance folks and also um, regulators as well. So with that, I'm happy to open it up for some questions um, from the room or um, from those online. Thank you. Right, you've got some yeah, go oh, good hands up already. Hello, I'm Heather Ripley, professor in the department and a global tobacco control professional um, for decades. And you mentioned that you've been going all around the country and the world. And in honor of it being World No Tobacco Day, um, I'm interested in the idea that this is a transnational tobacco industry. And how does the FDA work with stakeholders abroad? Or how do you navigate that they're doing this in a global strategy and where the US kind of fits into that? Amen. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, and thanks for acknowledging World No Tobacco Day. I appreciate that and also the importance of, of global work. I will say that many countries look to the United States. Um, and I'm frequently reminded of that through our engagement, which occurs through a variety of ways. Um, so one of the most notable um, is um, through the Global Tobacco Regulators Forum, or GTRF. Um, it's kind of the Game of Thrones of tobacco regulators globally. And so we convene annually. Um, we just convened in Amsterdam um, last year. We were in India the year before. And the World Health Organization coordinates all of the regulators um, in key countries across the world. And we engage um, for several days each year. And we also meet quarterly. Um, as well. Um, and we talk about key topics of import. And frequently, there are discussions that are had across regul regulators in terms of, well, you know, this is implications for us as a result of what's happening in the United States. And we share information around impending policies that we're implementing, um, challenges and opportunities. Um, we also engage readily through the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And so folks know um, that um, the FCTC through World Health Organization, um, the first um, public health treaty in the world, um, although the United States is not a party, um, 
um, we regularly engage. I was in Panama um, for those discussions um, earlier this year. Um, we also regularly engage with the World Health Organization as well and coordinate with them very closely in terms of information sharing and various expert panels and meetings throughout the year. And that's the key conduit um, in terms of our engagement with other countries as the World Health Organization is frequently convening people. Um, and then we participate in, in that regard. We also do one-offs. Um, and so I frequently meet with colleagues um, from other countries. Um, my, my calendar is public, so I can tell you this happened, but I just recently met with my colleagues from Canada. Um, and it happens frequently with other countries as well, where we information share. Um, we talk about challenges and opportunities and also um, make sure that we provide sufficient information for um, impending um, or um, a subsequent strategies. And so it's happening at a variety of levels. Um, I will say um, that there's also opportunity for revived engagement as well, particularly as we see more countries starting to implement um, the necessary um, uh, components of FCTC. Um, and there's definitely a need for those higher income countries to engage more closely with low and middle income so that they um, get those best practices and learnings to prevent um, what I'll say was sometimes some of the hiccups um, that other countries that were further along the continuum of experience. Hi, um, Jeff Harrington Kremitz, I'm an associate professor here at USC. Um, I, so the, the FDA has done some really excellent work in terms of uh, their campaigns to prevent initiation among young people. Um, and, and you mentioned also, and we also need to work on, on cessation and there have been great campaigns to, to work on cessation. Um, but there's sort of, this middle part, right, in between when kids initiate a try product for the first time, or they try once or twice, um, and, and between that and, and getting to the point where they're actually like, oh, oh no, I'm addicted, I need to actually stop. So I wonder if there's been um, much discussion about, about what we can do to sort of prevent the escalation and mm -hmm. use. Right, that in between point. Not kids have already tried a product. How can we prevent them from continuing to try and, and getting to the point where they actually then need to, to feel like they need to, to stop? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great point, and it's one where I think um, you know there's definitely opportunity. Um, with the federal government, we follow a, a complementary yet distinct approach. Um, and so on the campaign front, I'll say that the cessation paradigm has been primarily among you know CDC with tips from former smokers, and then FDA has primarily been the prevention paradigm. That said, for our part, um, we do look at the continuum in terms of our planning around our campaigns. And so we have a multi-tiered scientific approach where we do first you know qualitative testing, identify underlying themes, which could include you know youth that are in that susceptibility window from, you know, maybe they've tried and experimented and haven't transitioned. Um, and then looking importantly at the next step of, okay, now let's start to evaluate these actual messages and see how they do, and then create a full-fledged campaign. And so I'll say that it's something that we've certainly looked at. Um, we do tend to see some benefit for everyone. Um, in terms of the prevention message still applies for those that were experimenters and hadn't transitioned. And so we want to be careful that, you know, do you need a separate campaign just to target this population or do you get net benefit from the overall approach that would be more generalized? And so I'll say that we welcome additional science in this space. And if there are distinct characteristics of that population, and we have research to demonstrate that, we could inform the qualitative work to make sure we test it. And then in turn, it turns up in the final, you know, ads that, that see the limelight. But I think it's a great point and a good reminder in everything we do about being mindful of the continuum and the fact that you know frequently we for kids especially we focus on only the ones that are using them frequently but i'll say you know remember all frequent users were at one point intermittent users and at one point they were never users and so let's try to cut it off when it comes to kids as early as possible and if you've got a message or a demographic to do that most effectively i think that's a critical area where you know we could use a data driven approach to accomplish that if, if it warranted it based on the science Thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll let well, one of the folks online. Yeah, the online people. Yeah, yeah. you um, matter, folks. Let's let's get some questions. <laughs> you do matter, and so so here's maybe a kind of a complex one, um, but it's about the issue of the interplay of cannabis and, yeah, and nicotine okay. products, and you know, of course, common methods of administration with vaporizers, especially in this state. Um, but I guess the, the question position towards you would be like, how do you collaborate with your other partners and federal agencies? You know, things are moving with the rescheduling cannabis, you know, and then how it's, you know, uh, FDA regulates some of the CBD products. And yeah. so, so how much, um, 
discussion and coordination on that front to watch with within your purview um, yeah do you all focus on yeah so i'll say you know first and foremost there's a lot of attention around this issue of course you're seeing i think a different trajectory for cannabis than you have seen for things like smoking where it's you know been denormalization for decades and now you kind of see a normalization of cannabis um, you know, and I think that there's implications for tobacco in a variety of contexts, not just concurrent use and also vehicles of use, but also I think in terms of policies. And so you're starting to see as well on the tobacco control front, at least, you know, smoke-free policies being um, potentially threatened in terms of, you know, use of combustible and, and cannabis. Um, that's in terms of actual um, activities, um, the Tobacco Control Act is very clear around our authorities. And so we've got authority around, you know, products that are containing um, nicotine. And so we cannot expend user fees on things that are not, um, you know, outside that space. That said, there is some commingling. And so, you know, obviously there's concurrent use. Um, if you look at a lot of the substance use, um, uh, you know, surveys and others, you can see there's a lot of concurrent use of these products. You also see an even harder overlay for things like, um, uh, you know, blunts or use of THC in, in e-cigarette products. And so in those contexts, it falls more within our lane. When it doesn't, we do um, coordinate closely with other federal partners. NIDA, I would say, is probably the most prominent um, in the space. Within FDA, there is a separate group of folks that are working on this. Um, you know, ultimately, um, there's been talk about how these could be regulated in the future. You know, that could include, um, you know, maybe another center that focuses on cannabis. Um, but of course, that would require um, congressional action, you know, similar to what was happened with, with tobacco products. And so I think it's definitely an area of interest. Um, given, um, you know, even though, you know, we have changed with schedule changes, it's still a federally listed product. And so there's certain things that can and cannot be done at the federal level. But for our part, we regularly engage with counterparts within FDA, within the paradigm that we can, given that there's no straight regulatory authority on these products um, by Congress, um, but also working closely with other partners in the federal government, including NIDA, CDC, um, SAMHSA, and others to make sure we're addressing it in a meaningful way in the interim, particularly as an increasing number of states are taking actions to normalize use of the products. So I think a lot of opportunity here, but we've got to be mindful of, of one, you know, making sure that we don't append progress we've made um, in terms of reducing tobacco-related disease and death, and also make sure that our science, um, our policies, and our communications are sufficiently nimble and mindful of the evolution of the landscape. Hi, Dr. King, uh, Alyssa Harlow, nice to, really, really great talk, nice to meet you earlier. Um, clinical assistant professor here. I have a bunch of questions, but oh, I'm wow. not going to ask all of them. A bunch of I know. I'm no, like, which no, one no. is best? Here? I feel <laughs> I'll ask more of like the broader ones. Um, okay. So you've mentioned prevention a, a bunch in your talk. You mentioned um, earlier in our meeting today. You know that we we want to prevent the same situation that we saw with Juul and you know in the 2010 uh, 2017 spike um we, we don't want a repeat of that you know we want to squash a nip it in the bud i think you said it earlier any products that you know might um, mimic that trend um so my question for you is in your opinion what do you think are the biggest red flags that we should be looking out for in products that might uh in the future take off in the same way among youth populations that we saw with e-cigarettes um, and what evidence do, do you and the CTP need uh, in order to sort of support that kind of evidence or that claim? Yeah, yeah. So thanks for the question. And I think, um, you know, we're definitely very interested in being more nimble in general. And so folks, I'm sure where we recently funded a new center um, for rapid surveillance. I'm Crystal Nebo and folks at Rutgers um, were awarded. And the, and the goal is really to make sure we're collecting data more expeditiously to complement our existing surveillance activities. And that surveillance information is really helpful to inform where we go. And so in terms of your question around, well, what indicators within that surveillance? Um, you know, one, I think it's like the terminal outcomes, of course, use, right? You know, we want to monitor if we have upticks. I think that we have to be very mindful, um, you know, again, that even slight upticks um, can be um, pre uh, precursors to what could come. You know, we certainly learned that with the issue of e-cigarettes and the youth use um, escalation that we saw in 2017. And so monitoring use, but also intermediaries to use as well. And so if we're seeing um, uh, certain factors in terms of youth susceptibility to products, interest, awareness, those intermediary indicators are very important to inform where we go in terms of use. And then on the front end, 
It's what are the influencers that are influencing both the susceptibility and the use, and that is primarily promotion and advertising. Um, and so without fail, we have many decades of science on this um, in the tobacco sphere, whether it be conventional cigarettes um, to e-cigarettes, um, that there's key indicators that have been um, you know, used by um, industry and others to promote these products in a way that are appealing to kids. And so looking for those key indicators um, and those um, different um, characteristics and mechanisms um, uh, to monitor what could potentially happen um, uh, down the road in terms of not only susceptibility to these products in use, and I think it's important. So again, it's comprehensive is key, but you want to address it at all ends of the continuum. And I think we'd be remiss by just focusing on one. You have to have a comprehensive and nimble approach um, to address across that whole continuum. Um, and uh, that's that's my 10 cents. Um, I went a little over my two cents and keep the change. Okay, so maybe you have a dollar for the response to this question. We'll see. What is it? Well, uh, I mean, it's it's pretty interesting. Um, so it's basically about the nicotine analogs, like metadine, and and so yeah. kind of what's um, what should we be aware of in, in the scientific and public health community with regards to that in relation to FDA and CDP. Yeah, yeah. So I'll say that um, FDA more generally is continuing to evaluate this situation. So for folks who aren't aware, um, we are seeing nicotine analogs that have uh, uh, emerged again as an attempt to circumvent um, regulation in the United States. Um, these uh, products um, are called nicotine analogs because they're not nicotine in terms of their stereochemistry, but you know, for example, 6-methyl nicotine, you tack on a methyl group um, and it, it, it changes into a nicotine analog. Um, that said, um, the emerging science of which there's not much suggests that these, particularly 6-methyl nicotine, could potentially be six times as potent in terms of use liability um, and addiction, which is highly concerning to us. Um, and so we're continuing to evaluate the science and to explore um, the the best route to regulate these products. Um, in terms of regulatory authorities at the, at the FDA, we have a variety of potential channels. Um, it's not just the Center for Tobacco Products, there's also drug authorities as well. Um, and so we're pursuing um, the most viable action um, to address these issues, but ultimately they can be regulated um, through a variety of just different channels. And we wanna make sure that we've done our due diligence to identify what that pathway is and to make sure we have sufficient understanding of the available science before we take those actions. So I'd say more to come on it. We're certainly aware of it um, and, and looking at the best um, approach to take action. 